Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, together with my co-host, Bethany Ruff. Hello, hello. Welcome to the show. Kind of a last minute uh, ability to jump on, I'd say. I'm excited. That's awesome. I don't know if you'll be able to stay the whole time, but i um, so glad you're here to join us to welcome another amazing guest to the show. Dr. Stephanie Rimka is a holistic brain optimization specialist focused on integrated neurotherapies to identify and address the root cause of mental illness, learning disorders, and chronic illness. She has dedicated over 25 years of learning to, be- to learning the best practices in functional medicine from the masters of their fields. Dr. Rimka built Brain and Body Solutions into the premier brain-based disorder healing facility in Atlanta. Patients travel from across the globe to experience her healing playground of comprehensive and permanent brain therapies, including brain imaging, biofeedback, functional nutrition, epigenetics, cognitive testing, nutrient therapy, psychology, chelation, detoxification, chiropractic, and Chinese medicine. Dr. Rimka is the winner of the People's Choice Award 2020 for Best Mental Health Practice in Buckhead via Atlanta Best Media Group. Dr. Rimka is active in private practice, seeing clients one-on-one, teaching online groups, and most importantly, raising her teenage son, Bennett. Dr. Rimka, what an honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Well, I am so happy to be here. Thank you, Casey and Bethany, for being able to join us last minute. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, I have to say, so I came across your work when we interviewed Ade Fox. Um, obviously, she's known as a black carnivore online on her socials. And she is somebody who can get really fired up about stuff. And I really enjoy that. Uh, she's very passionate about what she does. And a few months ago, as I was researching to do her interview, I was listening to one of the interviews she gave where she was talking to another doctor. And Ade was pretty fired up about stuff. But this doctor that she was interviewing was even more fired up. It's like, holy smokes, this doctor is like, super engaged and excited about this important message. Could you guess who that might be? <laughs> I don't know. It's, I don't, I, I think I'm laid back. You, think I'm... <laughs> you were talking about like nutrient guidelines and, um, you know, all kinds of things that, that were going on in the world that we didn't all oh, necessarily yeah. agree with. And I'm like, man, this, right. this girl's going to be passionate. I really love it. <laughs> I do get a little, I don't really like bullshit. And liars. So that's great. That's great. Well, you're going to be a great guest on the show. Welcome to the show. Um, I I really want to clarify kind of what you do because on paper, you seem to do it all. It very almost like seemingly unrelated things that all do relate to the same thing. Can you tell us a little bit about (laughs) what you, what you do? Yeah. So it does. So everything you see on my website, isn't necessarily always me right? So I have a a team of clinicians and I work in a holistic manner. So as where I'm not a psychologist, I'll have a psychologist uh, on staff under my employee. Um, However, how I kind of got here, so what integrated neurotherapies mean is basically it's brain therapies and central nervous system therapies that are designed um, and I'm integrating them in such a way that a lot of other people have not. So I look at electrical activity. I look at magnetic activity. I look at, uh, I use light for healing. So I use electricity, magnetism, light um, to help heal brain disorders. And typically brain disorders are uh characterized by being identified as a mental health disorder. And there's a big mistake in Western Rockefeller medicine where they don't understand that mental health is really about brain health. And I understood that very quickly, you know, probably 20 years ago or so working in a mental hospital with schizophrenics and seeing nobody get better, like something's really deeply flawed in the way uh, medicine is approaching this, the way psychiatry is approaching this. So and basically, if you're going to try and heal a brain, you can't <laughs> ignore uh, systemic inflammation. You can't ignore the gut. You can't ignore the other biochemistry involved that really makes the kind of internal weather state. I'm always looking at people and their hormones and their neurotransmitters and the whole chemistry of them is kind of the weather state. Like, where are they? Are we a, a tsunami? Are we a peaceful day? Are we a depressed weather system? Or is it a tornado? Like what's going on? Is that the background, you know, weather? And how does the brain structure fit within that? So you kind of have to do a lot of things if you're going to address uh, mental health issues and, and brain issues, because it's all interrelated. And um, these different brain therapies are typically things that most people, 
people don't know about, right? Because their their physicians aren't telling them anything about it, and insurance won't pay for it, and um, it's not a pill. So mm. I, I'm the kind of that I'm typically a last resort after they've tried. I, I was literally told that today from a patient in Canada. You are my last resort. Wow. Wow, that's so powerful. I think to better understand kind of how you got to where you are, we need to hear your story. I mean, you were you grew up in Detroit, is that correct? And and kind of being sure. being in the medical field was a way for you to kind of escape. Yeah, I thought so. I grew up, you know, my mother hates for me to say it, but you know, we were we were pretty poor. I mean, she provided very, very well for what she could, but she was uh, you know, single mom, four kids, I'm the youngest of four, you know, it was the seventies, thank God. And so mortgage wasn't, uh, insane, but, um, by bad choices, by other people in our family, my mother was left alone with, with no help, no support, no father, we had no grandparents, we had nothing. So we had her and she had to hustle and work real hard to make things happen. We, we always had food and we had a roof over our heads. Most of the time, there was a short stint in my teenage years where we were homeless living out of our car, but, um, I, I saw it as like, there aren't many choices, right? It's kind of like doctor, lawyer, chief, <laughs> that's all you're going to be. Like, how do you, how do you not be poor? Uh, I guess I'll be a doctor. Um, and I went to school with a lot of kids that luckily my mother was able to, even though we lived in the inner city of Detroit and, and, uh, we needed government assistance. And even though she worked and everything, she was able to somehow finagle and, and mastermind. She's a very unreasonable person. And she got us free scholarships at a very uh, wealthy private Catholic school district. So she was able to drive us in to where all the rich kids went to school. And because it was uniforms, it, we could, aff- could afford the clothing, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, I, I think no matter what I was going to end up helping people. I think it's just, I can't escape this. Um, health and service is, is hardwired into me in every way, but, uh, that was to me the way to, to make money. You know, that's what I was thinking of. And then college, I kind of had a, mm, I've, uh, I'm kind of more of a deeply driven consciousness kind of person. And so in college, I really said, wait a minute, why do I want to do this? Like, am I just doing this for money? Because if that's the case, I, I I can't do it. So I didn't really know what the word values and integrity meant, but I was already displaying them around 1920. So I really was like, mm, I need to really figure this out and do some internships and like shadow some doctors because committing eight years, because that would be would have been four more years of medical school and then surgical residency. I'm like, this is a lot to commit to and to go into debt if I'm just doing this for my ego, like I really, I need to be sure this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it was kind of like that whole process of interning and shadowing doctors and working in the field that I became very um, disillusioned with what I was seeing. And the fantasy in my mind, right, of what a doctor did and what I was seeing didn't match even though I still wanted to be one, I still wanted to help people, but I didn't see it working. So I was very confused, needless to say. Um, And luckily, you know, and I say that seriously, luckily I had a back injury at 16 and it landed me in my best friend's brother's office. My best friend, you know, said, why don't you go see my, why don't you go see Keith? So I said, why would I see Keith? Because he's a chiropractor. I'm like, what's that? And sure enough, my mom knew what it was and took me to Keith to start getting adjusted at 16 uh, after, a, after a soccer injury. And through the years of getting adjusted by him, I wasn't putting two and two together until about 23 years old, 22 years old, something like that, where I was like, why am I so much happier when I see you consistently? I go, I don't get it. Like my mood, everything about me is totally different when I see you versus when I don't. And then he broke down a conversation about the nervous system and uh, intelligence, basically. Like at that point, I called myself an atheist. Um, so I didn't want to hear his life force, spiritual woo woo conversation. But in that moment, it made more sense to me when he talked about it in terms of light and frequency and consciousness and the nervous system and the brain and sensory and motor and all the stuff that I understood from a biological standpoint while I was working with schizophrenics in a mental hospital. Um, I just had an aha moment. I said, wait a minute. So the schizophrenics need to be adjusted. He goes, yes. I said, then I'm, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. 
And six months later, I moved to Atlanta and, uh, to become a chiropractor. But it was all to help people with mental illnesses and drug addiction and alcoholism. That was my whole motivation for doing it. I have a quick question for you as far as that goes. In my work, I do structural integration, so I'm dealing with tissue and nervous system. And mm-hmm. do you find, is it hard to separate out? Is it a top-down or bottom-up issue? Is it is the imbalance starting in the tissue that's affecting the nervous system, which is affecting the brain? It's like the chicken or the egg question. Yeah, well, so if you talk about it in kind of our three-dimensional plane here, I'd say it's both, but I really think it comes in from a soul incarnate level. Um, I, I, I see things kind of more in a deeper esoteric pranic soul uh, frequency. The soul comes in with its personality and, and its stuff. The soul, it's got a history and a story, just like our physical bodies, you know, trauma and fascia. And I mean, we, you know, we hold it in this physical body. That spiritual body holds stuff too. So you kind of come in. It's why you can, it's why people always say like, wow, look at these four kids in a family and how different each one is. And every mother will say, yeah, I'm just telling you, this is how they came. They had that personality. They had, they were like this. I, I couldn't, I couldn't stop them from being this way. So just when it comes to a physical structural way, I don't know any way to separate it. There's no way for me not to address, um, like you say, both ways. I, I have to come from it at the same time, very holistically. And luckily that's how my brain works. I'm not a very linear, um, kind of a person. So I can overwhelm my patients by the fact that I'm seeing so many things at once, (laughs) but uh, that's how I have to do it. You have to go, I think, all of it. And that's why I might need to employ other people to help me, right? I'd say, look, this is the part I'm going to handle. I'm seeing the whole thing, but I need, you know, I need Beth, need to see Bethany two two times a week because she's going to do this part while I'm doing this part, right? That's so interesting and really, really cool that obviously you could take a lot on your plate, but to be able to refer out and kind of have a good relationship with other body workers and other people in that healing field. Before I move on from that question entirely, so you were saying that your belief is almost in like inherited epigenetic traits from generations we might have not even like ever known. Oh, absolutely. The DNA is a helical structure that is really about sacred geometry. And that's, it's the shape in and of itself that's holding the information. It's not the genetic SNPs that the single nucleotide polymorphisms that everybody thinks it is on this kind of flat level. Um, It's all about geometry and how shapes hold information. So yeah, it's without a doubt, Um, just like we can't figure out where memory really is coming from because you can cut apart a brain all over the place and things are still there. You know, like we have no idea why this mat, this mouse still figures out this maze because we've basically obliterated the whole thing. That's why we know it's in the field. So we know it's in the field and, or uh, the field is created by the, the sacred geometrical shapes of the DNA. Wow. That's so interesting. That reminds me of how you meet somebody seemingly for the first time, but you kind of already know them somehow. Oh yeah. <laughs> Can't explain yeah. it. Yeah. No, I totally believe in that. It is interesting that it can be generational from, you know, what Bethany was kind of suggesting. I think we know that, you know, if the mother is insulin resistant, she's going to pass on that to the kid who, you know, needs to prepare himself for, you know, a, a world of too much sugar. Correct. Right. Yeah. The, the, the science on uh, the basic, like not getting esoteric, but the science on um, epigenetic transfer of information lines down is very clear. There's no doubt. That we, we know that that happens. Um, it's not the first place I start with people because I want them to be in the present and I want them to move themselves forward. And um, some people do hook onto that uh, for a victim martyrdom kind of banner and flag they like to raise. I mean, again, I... I dealing with mental health, that's what everybody's basically coming to me for. So I have my fair share of having to entrench people out of them believing they're like a victim to their family's past trauma. I'm like, no, that's not how this works. Right. So you got to be really careful with that. Like, yes, there's these unknown forces and unknown causes that might be invisible to the naked eye or to somebody who doesn't know how to look for it. And you have to be careful. You don't let that become like baggage weighing you down as an excuse. And you, you pick up something you, you certainly didn't need to. You, I don't know if that makes sense for you guys. I see a lot of that in this industry and it does concern me. Mm, yeah, I could see that going both ways with somebody where like rehashing an old trauma just kind of opens the the scab again and they keep feeling cycles of pain, but also in a way that, you know, they, they could be embracing it and feeling it and letting that, that 
you know, trauma dissolve over time. It must be a yeah. difficult balance. It is. It's like, you know, it, it's the fine line of you have to, it has to be intentional. The only reason to relive any type of trauma is you can come from it at a place of empowerment and you can get it to release that energy that's been stuck inside the system. It needs to go, but just to relive it or re-talk about it and this, it just rewires and makes it stronger, um, which is part of the problem with a lot of the traditional ways therapies have been done. They're actually re-traumatizing people. Um, and cause what you practice grows whether we're talking about it in an esoteric meditative state or a deeply neurological uh, state or, you know, a musculoskeletal state, what you practice grows. And if you keep practicing being traumatized or telling your victim story, it's going to grow. And that's, that network's going to be very hard to break through. Mm, so interesting. You mentioned being in the field and noticing that the conventional ways that you were taught kind of wasn't working that well. Food is a big part of that. And I'm wondering when you came across the information that, it kind of showed you that what you're being taught about food was not necessarily uh, correct. Wow. Well, that's a big one. So um, chiropractors are taught about food. We get a ton of nutrition. Uh, you know, you have to imagine. So naturopaths get a ton of it, you know, Chinese medical doctors. Now these systems are different and they're maybe a little bit of opposed to each other. Uh, my primary education in grad school was, um, uh, natural hygiene. And believe it or not, our professor who was teaching this, he was a vegan and he was very slanted. However, he did a good job presenting the information. And it was kind of my first foray into primal living. Uh, natural living hygiene is a little bit skewed um, in one regards, but they're very good about looking at like, what were primal people doing? What, what makes sense with the seasons and the cycles and the temperature? What's available? Let's, let's think about this uh, a little bit more locally. Um, so learning about all of that, I got to tell you, like nutrition, when it comes to mental health or anything, any health issue is, I get why it's confusing for people because you have incredibly strong camps um, writing their books and selling their idea. And humans really have a hard time admitting, you know, they're wrong per se, or that they change their mind. Um, and in fact, like we politicize, like we call that, we call that person a flip flopper instead of that they evolved and learned more and just said, Oh, wow, I was wrong. I, I thought one way until I learned more information. And we often criticize that. So people are afraid to admit it. So I, I was in my early 20s. I mean, I learned right. I mean, I, I was attacking that concept in grad school to try to figure out this has to be involved. I didn't know necessarily the right answer. And I went vegan um, for 12 years uh, and tons of water fasting and juice fasting and, and all kinds of I pretty much tried almost everything and anything as I think most aggressive clinicians are going to do. <laughs> We're just going to try anything on our sure. What is that? I got to do it for 30 days or three months or something. Um, so I made the connection uh, pretty quickly. And my uh, nephew was diagnosed with autism while I was in grad school. And that opened up a whole new world um, being trained by all the doctors there to deal with autism. That's why I eventually ended up, you know, really focusing on that. And uh, the GAPS diet is kind of the foundation uh, of that whole thing. So it, it was pretty quickly, like in grad school, right? Learning, like as soon as doctors like, oh yeah, you cannot get autism better until we deal with this gut. And what they eat is everything at this point. Like it's one of our strongest uh, therapeutic interventions. So I, I've been kind of devouring diets and dietary interventions for different disease pathologies for, you know, almost 30 years now. Mm. Is there anything you suffer from, from being on a vegan diet for that long? 12 years. That's pretty dedicated. Uh, yeah. And I was two years vegetarian before that. So it was 14 years total. Yeah, it was a, it was, it wasn't good. <laughs> it, went, it went downhill pretty bad. Um, it ended up just well, so here's the thing. Here's the thing that vegans don't like to say and admit. And we all whisper it to each other afterwards, right? After we come out of it, you're incredibly depressed, right? So mental performance, depression is incredibly high. I would have argued with you about it and I would have lied. Oh, no, I'm fine, you know. Um, but you, I battled definitely a lot of depression. And by the time I got in, what the, the catalyst was, I was having a lot of bizarre 
um, kind of like hot, like menopause things. And most of my friends are like 20 years older than me. And they just were like, Stephanie, this is like menopause. What are you talking about? You're up all night sweating. I'm like, yeah, I don't know what's going on. They're like, that's called hot flashes, you know, and you're, you know, you're 30. You shouldn't be having that. And I was like, what? Um, and I had crazy periods and I had all kinds of stuff that I just sucked it up. So I had really bad periods and, and, uh, was having hot flashes. And so when I went into the doc, finally said like, you really need to get your hormones checked. I'm like, okay. And they were like, you basically have almost nothing. You have almost no estrogen. You, you saw the uh, thyroid was done. They go, your thyroid's crash. So I'd gained a lot of weight. I was depressed. I had acne. Um, you know, but I really thought I was doing like the right thing spiritually. I was very tied into thinking this was some path to kind of transcendence, right? Consciousness. And that, that meant a lot to me. I, I was very sensitive, you know, they, a vegan pamphlet of like tortured bunnies was put in my face and I cried and that was it. I just felt like, ah, you know, so it was a very emotional decision and it's very easy to, um, get a highly sensitive and empathic person to think that they're causing suffering and death and torture to an animal. And go, we don't want to do that. And I was willing to let myself, you know, suffer and basically torture myself. So I was starving. Uh, and when in this one doc, you know, geneticist, and she just looked, she's like, we got to put you on everything. And she's, and you're infertile and you can't get, you can't get pregnant. And you're, you're, you're like, if you continue, she said there, if this continues, you will probably have cancer in three years. Like this is, I'm wow. trying to tell you, you have to stop. So her and an endocrinologist, um, they lovingly just said, we get it that this is hard for you spiritually, but like, if you believe in any, and I really, you know, it's like, I'm kind of a universal intelligence kind of a gal. And it's like, whatever you believe in is, you think you're supposed to be suffering, like, like not feeling well. So I, I took a while for me to be okay with it. Um, but what I had is over those, over those 14 years, I went on a few mission trips, uh, doctor, like mission trips to Costa Rica, Mexico, Brazil. And in those times I was forced to kind of eat whatever, right. Cause people are feeding you and you just have to be like, I have to just say, thank you and eat this food. Like I can't even question what's happening right now in this whole process. So all the vegetarians basically had to eat meat and whatever was put in front of us. And everybody would be worried. Like, like my stomach would be a mess or I'd be sick. And they're like, you like, and other doctors are dropping like flies. Cause we're seeing like 350 patients a day. I mean, it's like insane what you just stand there and do for 12, 13 hours. But I was feeling like bulletproof. I felt amazing. I had great energy. I wasn't in hurting, you know, I was like, I'm all fine. I don't know. <laughs> you know? So when I looked back at those experiences, I went, no wonder I felt so good. Cause I was just eating and I mean, when I was saying I was eating meat, I mean, they were giving me stuff like heart. And I was like, I finally was like, I don't want to know anymore. Don't tell me, don't, don't translate. I'm just going <laughs> to eat whatever they put on my plate, you know? Cause I was like, you know, they said something like fish sperm. And I'm like, that can't be the right word. I don't want to know anymore <laughs> what I'm eating. So, so yeah. So luckily I had that. And I kind of looked back on it and said, right. And there was just this moment of grace that came over and I realized I don't judge a lion for killing the gazelle. So why am I judging myself so harshly? Why am I willing to suffer? So I had to look at my own disdain for myself, my own, my, my pain, my shame, my, my whatever unconscious scripts that were making it okay that I thought I needed to be uh, punished. Did you eventually find that you had to strike a balance between incorporating some amount of vegetables with more of a meat-based diet? Or did you find for yourself and your patients that any amount of vegetables was kind of detrimental? Um, yeah, it definitely varies per person. Uh, some people, I mean, it really varies, especially in the mental health space and the level of the gut damage and the level of um, kind of autoimmune type reactions they're having. So I'm very kind of customized with that, with my methylation profile. My, my low methylators cannot have anywhere near as many folate rich things as other people. Um, 
MS patients almost always do better. The more I eliminate, the better off they are. Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, they, they can't handle that stuff. It, it just doesn't work. The more, the more carnivore-ish I get them with kind of a GAPS diet, fermentation, broth kind of a thing, the better off they are. Um, so it really varies. Uh, but I have a certain subset of population that do really well with a certain amount of in-season, local, um, low-toxin plants that we incorporate. And, and it does balance and help them out. So it really is kind of custom to me, but I don't think anybody should be a vegetarian. I'm I'm pretty strong on that point now. Yeah. I'm I, a little bit about our personal story. We're trying to get pregnant and I've been going the route of acupuncture and more Chinese medicine just to make sure my body's in a nice, healthy, balanced state. And uh, I recently got blood panels done and I'm struggling to, I've been carnivore for two years and I'm struggling to find for me what the benefits would be of incorporating vegetables, but with hormones being like slightly off, what's being pushed at me right now is a vegetarian diet. No, it's more fruit and honey you need. You don't need the vegetables. You know, the, the vegetables, really the argument, it's tough because the fruit, you end up with a lot of deuterium, um, you know, isotope of hydrogen. But women, I will say, and a lot of women don't like to hear this in the carnivore community, um, we do do well our hormones need some carbs. The reason right before that period, we're craving a bunch of stuff, right? To build all that progesterone just on protein and fat is tricky. Uh, and that's when I tell people like, go for the higher carb stuff, eat more chicken or things like that at that time. But I would consider uh, for you, like looking into fruit and honey uh, and things more like fatty fruits as well, like avocado. Um, very, very different on the physiology than a plant, than a, I mean, a vegetable. See, it's funny. I even don't think of them as plants the same way, right? Um, it, it's, it's a different physiology. Again, I still like people to be in season and local. Mm-hmm. Um, and right now, most things, I don't know where you are. I think you guys are in Utah, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, nothing's yeah. in season. Skiing is in yeah, season. nothing snow. in season, right? Yeah, you got, you got snow in season. Skiing is in season. But um, but if I was working with fertility, stuff like that, I would I would be probably nudging towards a little bit of out of season eating to help with the hormone production. That feels um, so yeah, much I would definitely right. not go. I would not be going vegetarian. That is a strong thing they do. They go through, Oh, you know, I, it's, it makes no sense in yeah. the history of humans. If you look at any primal, anything, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. Your biggest issue is probably the plastics exposure you've been exposed to all your life, you mm-hmm. know, like that's probably the biggest problem. Um, but and that's tough, right? You have to constantly be detoxing. Like we're being poisoned to death and that's not your fault. Right. But that's super, sure. super insightful. I really appreciate your yeah. wisdom with that. When we look at the primal nature of humans, do we tend to find a lot of cauliflower pizza crust and almond flour? Treats? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny because people forget, like they don't, well, they don't forget. They just don't know. They are, they're just taught a bunch of lies. There's a lot of propaganda that goes out there. And like, when I found out, like ultimately, you know, the majority of all these primal uh, cultures, you know, or anywhere, it's typically like 70 to hundred percent meat based, animal based, and they're eating all of it, right. The organs and the bone marrow and everything, they don't waste anything. Um, and we throw away the most nutritious part of our animals. Like that's, that's been the problem where we're only like skeletal muscle focused. Um, and then when they, the rest of the plants that were in there, it, it was on average and they've this pretty well established 200 to 300 different plants in the year. So if you're only eating, let's say, let's be generous, 30% of your diet is coming from plants, but it's spread among 300, you're having very small amounts of these each plant Mm. versus what do we do? We have superfoods. Everybody, how much kale and spinach and almonds can you shove in your Vitamix and try to guzzle down three times a day, right? Blueberries, it's the same 10 things at the most. So your average American eats, I think it's six to eight vegetables a year. Wow. I mean, that's, so like, look at the, the, it's the dose in and of itself that makes a huge difference, right? Like just like fitness, you can have a certain amount of, you know, running that's this minimum effective dose. That's perfect for a person. And then you can kill somebody by overtraining them. So it, it, we're, we're overdoing it 
by calling things a superfood and artificially eating them out of season and in ex- ridiculous amounts. Nobody would ever, if you came across almonds in nature, the only reason you would pick that thing up and eat it is because you're starving because there, it's way too much work to get to it. It's not that good. And you would only eat a few, but instead people eat like 300 a week because they're eating almond pancakes. You know, that's just completely abnormal. And the poisons inside of there are really, really damaging people over time. Do you find any benefits or what are your opinions as far as I've just seen them out on the market in most health food and grocery stores, the superfood antioxidant powder blend. So you're skipping the fiber step. You're skipping the digestion as far as that goes. Still kind of no, bullshit. I don't like any. I don't really like any of those. No. Mm, yeah, just a way to make money. It seems like so crazy. Yeah, I mean, it, it, things can have their place. Again, if I'm doing, if you got a treatment protocol for somebody with an inflammatory disorder that's causing psychosis, I may have to use some crazy antioxidants. It's very common. Vitamin C is a very common thing I have to use. Um, but in general, no. Those extractions, um, it, it's. I find it to be nonsense. And in fact, a lot of these supplements are because they're the, the water they're using and the way they're extracting them, they end up being very, very high in toxins, a variety of toxins that people are actually making themselves sicker with the things they think are making them better. Wow. Well, that's the thing is people do think they're doing the right thing when they're moving towards those types of supplements, eating more fruits and vegetables, blending everything together and getting all of it together. Like you mentioned, I wonder if you could go back and explain what happens in the brain when people are doing that. Like when you look back at yourself being vegan for 12 years, what was happening in your brain because of the foods you were eating, you thought were like super healthy for you? Um, you want to know like on a physiological level or yeah, sure. psychologically Absolutely. or, yeah. I mean, you mentioned um, depression. I know a lot of vegans get really angry about stuff in a way that most of us oh, yeah. are more <laughs> carnivore. Like we don't really get too angry about the same kind of yeah. stuff. It's weird. I will say and it's definitely worse. Right. So I wasn't ever like that. And I hung out with a ton of vegans and nobody was full of the level of rage that I see in the community today. I will say that. Now we might've been superior and condescending. I will say that's a very common trait, right? Virtue signaling, because we do think we're doing, like you deeply believe you're doing the right thing. And I bought into the lies that it was saving the planet, right? They, they hook the environmental thing onto it. So you just think this is like the win-win, like it's the healthiest thing. Plus I'm saving the planet. I'm like, I am saving the world, right? You get a way to feel like a superhero for basically sitting on your ass eating tofu, okay? So it's a way you can feel like you're doing something when you're really doing nothing. And, you know, people look for that shortcut. You don't know you're doing that. Um, but the, the, so you're, you're trying to, like I said, the brain doesn't, the ego doesn't want to be wrong. So it's basically going to constantly be looking for evidence. Like I made the right decision. I made the right decision. So it's going to constantly be trying to validate itself. So it's going to be looking for that. It's no different than, you know, I do get nervous. The carnivore community at times starts to do the same thing, but the difference is vegan brains are starving, right? So you have a starved brain in, in severe malnutrition because of that, it's typically going to be more limbic system control, more emotional fight or flight control versus the higher order of learning prefrontal cortex. Uh, it, that's going to be more offline. So the limbic system is deep inside, kind of like uh, reptilian, what we call more emotional. Um, it'll hijack the brain whenever it's in a life or death situation. It's supposed to, which is good because we want it to react really fast. It also, that's the area you, where you fall in love as well. Like, so falling in love is a very stupid, illogical thing to do. So the brain has to go offline from cortical thinking. Otherwise it would talk you out of it. You'd be like Spock. You'd be like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would, you know, it's illogical. So I'm not going to, I'm not beaten on the limbic system. And I, I, I like that we have this primitive ability because that's where falling in love happens as well, which is awesome, but it can lead to some bad decisions. And it feeds more on sugar and versus the prefrontal cortex, uh, cortical likes ketones a lot more, likes fat a lot more. So if you, uh, you can just switch a brain by giving it a shit ton of carbs and sugar, and it's going to be more reactive because it's going to be more limbic system driven versus more ketogenic brain, more ketones, it's going to be more cortical 
So it's just going to have more rational thinking to begin with, right? And it's very hard to get a vegan brain uh, into ketosis. They're mm. very rare. Are you going to have that, right? So the brain is 70% cholesterol saturated fat to begin with as well. And they don't have enough of it, right? So every cell in your body makes cholesterol except the red blood cells, right? So everybody can make their own. The liver's main job is to make its own. The brain is in there trying to make its own, but we still need to eat it. That's like our backup system, right? So when you're not eating any cholesterol on top of that, it's again, the structure starts to get deformed. The brain starts to shrink. So there's a, a myriad of reasons why that brain is not thinking as well, why it's not as bright, it's not as big, it's not as heavy, it's starving, you know, then you throw in all the B vitamins, the zinc deficiency, the carnitine deficiencies, um, it, it adds up. And the brain is a little bit just more agitated on fire because it's it's panicked, right? It feels like it's in a famine all the time. Wow. That's so interesting. What are your favorite dietary strategies to increase ketones endogenously inside the body? Um, we know there's many different ways that somebody could choose to do that. What would be like maybe going from some of the most basic ways that somebody could do that to some of the more advanced, like maybe even up to like a strict carnivore diet or something? Well, your most basic would be to stop eating. So <laughs> fasting, will, if you want to get there fast, you fast. I mean, uh, the, the body will kick it into that. And I say that joking, but seriously, I am a very big fan of, uh, water fasting, uh, going in rhythm of, of cycles. It makes total sense that most cultures went through a yearly water fast. That's why we call it spring cleaning. You come out of the winter, your stores are gone. The animals aren't there yet. Nothing's really growing yet to bring the animals back. There's going to be some fasting time that happens. There's your spring cleaning every single year. So I'm a big fan of a five-day water fast, basically at the end of winter, early spring for most of my patients gone. So before that, we want to keep them, get them ready, get them in a low carb ketogenic state. Uh, so January and February to me, the perfect time of January, even if somebody's never carnivore, January, January is a perfect month, <laughs> January to February to go carnivore um, and increase kind of time restricted feeding, you know, increasing how long you fast, throwing some one meal a days here and there a few times a week. Um, so that's one of the best ways. So let's say somebody's not mentally, psychologically capable of that. I have an eating disorder or something like that. Um, it's carb restriction. That's how you do it, right? Getting into ketosis is not about how much fat you shove in your mouth. It's about restricting how much glucose you throw in your mouth. Um, that's the best way. Um, protein does not cause gluconeogenesis on de like just because it's only an on-demand process. So uh, I'm not at that school that protein restricts ketosis at all. It doesn't make any sense. There's no science really behind it. it it's an on-demand activity. So you're only going to make it if you need it. And that's the beauty of our bodies. It's going to control that. So some, you know, carnivores get, oh, my blood glucose is still up. I'm like, yeah, because you, what, did you work out two hours that day? Yeah. I'm like, well, because you needed it. You had to liberate it, you guys. So one is not eating. That, that's really your best way. Um, I, MCT oil will do the job and the liver. So that's a classic one. Um, eight carbon caprylic acid, you know, taking that. I use some... Um, blends. Uh, Christopher Shade of Quicksilver has made some genius blends that are some liver supports that go in and um, turn on the AMPK pathway and turn off mTOR. So there's whole synergistic plant medicines and other things that uh, mimic fasting. So I can mimic fasting in somebody and make their liver make a bun bunch of ketones without them even really, I can put them in fake ketosis in an hour and a half. Wow. So that's a, pro you know, it's a stupid name, but it's uh, keto on demand is what he calls it because yeah, you do that. So it's a blend of, you know, quercetin and berberine and a couple other plant things that you're like, we know that's what they do. They trigger the epigenetics and they cause a whole cascade. MCT does it in a different way. Um, it doesn't trigger as many genes, but in, in sirtuins and anti-cancer pathways. So those would be kind of my main things. Um, I, I, rarely recommend exogenous ketones. I do those in very specific neurological cases that do have their place uh, for traumatic brain injuries, concussions, seizures, autism, autism at times, Alzheimer's dementia. So those are the people that can benefit greatly from us just putting the ketones in there. Um, 
while we're still working on, uh, like if I'm, if I tell everybody knows me, I'm like, if I'm in a car accident and I'm in a hospital, you come start, you open my mouth, you start shoving ketones down, <laughs> MCT oil down, you start hooking me up to some neurofeedback while I'm in a coma. I got a whole plan. You better do it. I don't, you know, so it has its place, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it doesn't, it's not as much work as people think. It's really about the liver. You know, you got to get the liver healthy. So I'll do things like castor oil packs and coffee enemas and stuff like that. But if the liver can't do it, then, and most people can't because they got a lot of fatty liver from too many carbs and alcohol. Oh, alcohol. That's a tough one. <laughs> people want to keep drinking alcohol. And I'm like, oh, pumpkin, we can't do that. <laughs> so yeah, that's trying to find them an alcohol alternative. That's a big one. You know, because I get it. I get they're stressed out. And I'm like, even the keto wine, I sell the keto wine and I I get it, dry farm wines. And I'm glad the stuff exists. But I will tell you, for most women over 40, even that's going to knock you out. It, it, we, we just can't process it the same way. Mm, interesting. So. I, you mentioned fasting as the number one thing, and I have to certainly agree. Like I've, I've seen people take it too far. And I, I think even sometimes in my own life, just eating one meal a day carnivore has been, you know, good for a while and then detrimental the longer I did it. Um, yeah. but however, I, I have to say that fasting, I haven't yet seen it not work for whatever desired result I wanted to see in one of my clients. Is that fair to say? Have you ever seen fasting by and large, not work. I have never not seen it work when done right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Super interesting. And I don't even say, I consider OMAD, right? Like, especially on carnivores. I, I don't know if I would call that fasting. I, I just find it to be convenient. Like, I, I think I'm very nervous about fasting in carnivores because like I, that to me, like, I, don't, I hate the word intermittent fasting. I just consider it normal eating, but one meal a day when you're a carnivore, it's easy to fall into because we're so satiated, but it's not enough protein. So it's not enough protein to really meet the demands, especially when someone's trying to heal, overcome something, um, or even just living, you know, in a modern lifestyle, sitting at computers, driving cars, not moving as much, you know, being radiated by 5G all the time, having 60 hertz electricity surround them all night while they sleep, a smart meter by their head. Uh, it's just not enough protein. Uh, the research is pretty definitively clear um, about how much protein we need, as, especially as we're aging. And I'm just dealing with an aging population all the time. And the protein study is real. The numbers need to be much higher. And if I'm trying to get a gram of protein in per pound of body weight you want to be, I can't eat that much. I can't eat 130 grams of protein in one meal. I, I never do it. So I have to supplement with the essential amino acids um, most of the time. So I don't love, like when I move somebody carnivore or low carb keto or something, I make them eat three times a day. And sometimes they're like, what? I'm like, just, you're going to have to, that's the only way I'm going to get 30 grams of protein to pop in you, which isn't really a lot anyway. But, um, so yeah, that one meal a day makes me nervous when people do it on and on and on forever. I think men can get away with it a lot more than women, especially like when we're like 30 to 50 years old, we have very complicated hormones and it's a, it's a symphony of what needs to be done. And we have very different needs every single week of the month. Uh, and I, it makes me very nervous when people try to stick with, well, why are you doing that? Are you hungry more than that? Well, yeah. I'm like, well, then why don't you eat when you're hungry? Right. It's like, I try to get them down to like, can we, once we get them, their body not disordered and not full of pathogens, then we get it stable. They'd be like, you've got to start trusting hunger signals. Like you should eat when you're hungry, drink when you're thirsty, have sex when you're horny in an ideal state, sleep when you're tired. If people did more of that, instead of constantly overriding the signals our body is giving them, then we wouldn't be in some of the messes that we are, but we like to ignore the intuitive messages from our body all day long. Now, if you could just follow me around all day and give me a gentle reminder of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I know. That's what I tell people. The reality is it's going to be, it's real going to be real gentle until it's not. I don't yeah. know. It's just like, like I am a mother, right? We talk real gentle until it doesn't. That's why we yell. I'm like, well, if the gentle work, I wouldn't have to yell. Right? <laughs> the point, right? And spirit's going to do the same thing. It's like, well, I was being gentle, but now here's your two by four. Yeah. And, if you, and then you're like, oh. I got the message. I'm like, all right, you got the message. That's why people have so many transformational, incredible spiritual moments after a cancer diagnosis or an MS diagnosis or whatever. Why? Because it was their two by four and they made a choice and they either changed everything or they didn't. 
Mm. Right. So they either learned a lesson or they didn't, but I, I, we all want to learn that lesson in a gentler, easier way. So that's my job to try and nudge, you know, my clients to show them. I'm like, let me, let me show you the rightness in everything that's happening, how every symptom, ache, pain, whatever is actually a guidepost. This is actually your benefit. This is a blessing. You're getting a phone call from the universe that, and you need to listen, like instead of ignoring it. Otherwise, it's just going to get worse. Right. So, yeah, it's a, you know, I, I am a big fan of eat more, most likely, um, because then this way people go off the wagon. That's why they go, oh, I went into the ice cream and da, da, da. I'm like, right, because what were you trying to, you know, versus a very intentional fast. That's a very different thing. When you know I'm doing this for a purpose, it's very, very different um, psychologically on the system. It's like cold plunging, right? Falling in a cold lake accidentally is not the same as consciously stepping into a cold tank. It's very, very different on the nervous system. You mentioned um, a little while back that in some cases it can be beneficial to supplement with branched chain amino acids. If someone is choosing to go that route or, or incorporate that, what are they looking for in that supplement? Just because things are so tricky with supplements not being regulated by the FDA. Okay. So I wouldn't recommend branched chain. Um, so those are three um, essential amino acids. I'd be looking for all of the essential amino acids. So there's a couple different formulas. So there's about 20 amino acids, roughly depending on the science and your age, nine to 10 are essential. Okay. Meaning you can't make them. Uh, but if we get those, we can make the other ones. So we can, we, we're good if we have enough protein. Um, the only protein sources that have all of them, all the completes are animal products. To get them from plants takes a little bit of effort, but it can be done. It's just hard. Um, what they would look for in terms of a supplement, there's a couple of formulas. So the MAP essential amino acids, the master amino protocol, MAP EAA, it's often seen as, that's kind of a... Um, muscle focused formula and it'll have all of the essential amino acids in it um, minus the histidine, which is kind of essential, non-essential. Current research is kind of showing histidine might be more necessary than we think. So people are starting to, so anyway, the map one, let me just say that research muscle growth, uh, fighting sarcopenia, using it pre and post-workout. Um, it's coming from fermented uh, plant sources. So it is vegan actually. So I can get any vegetarian to get this in. And it's typically uh, a 10 gram dose is only five calories and it won't break a fast therefore. Right. So we're not getting an insulin response. So people can do this three times a day and it, it, it's equivalent to roughly 30 grams of protein. You can always take more and have it be more. Um, so MAP EAA is a formula that's focused on muscles. And those brands are like, um, Kion, Perfect Aminos, Optimal Aminos, um, Fortigen. Uh, it came off patent a few years ago. So that's why everybody can make it now. It used to just be MAP EAA. And that was the only brand you could buy. But LP7 is another formula. It's basically the same things. It's the seven amino acids that they've been studying in terms of fighting for Alzheimer's and dementia. So that formula, because they're just different like um, percentages of everything, that has me intrigued in terms of, is it really more beneficial for my cognitive patients? I'm not real sure, but in general, I'm looking for um, one of those big brands. And I will tell you in this industry, most things are just being white labeled. I mean, that's the reality of it. We're like, oh, it's the same company is making it. And so they're just all, they just sell it to Ben Greenfield. They sell it to this guy. They sell, and they're just all putting their own label on it. They're yeah. often not even, they're not even something different. That's, you, you know, I mean, that's the reality of it, right? And I figured that out looking at them. I'm like, oh my God, it's, the same, it's made the same factory. And because I'm on a, on a nutraceutical uh, medical advisory board, I, I was, I resigned recently, but a couple other advisory boards consult with me. And I know this now because now I've, I've been talking to the CEOs of all these factories. They go, he's like, what? I make like 70 of these companies. I make all their products. It's the same thing. Wow. I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, so I've learned a lot. Like it really isn't, you know, that big of a difference. So those are the brands that I know of, but it, metabolic maintenance makes them. So some of these things, I, I, they're on like my full script or, or Emerson or Wellabate, your doctor can prescribe them and you can get you like little discount. Um, I take optimal aminos. There's, there's really, most of them are 
going to be, if they're legit company, kind of Ben Greenfield's company, he makes a good product. He's actually been playing with the, he's added his studio back in it. And I'm kind of curious if he's, if he is, people are going to get better results with it. So what all they're doing is playing with the ratios, like how much methionine, how much leucine, but the gist is if you pick with one of those basic big companies, you're going to get enough leucine and that's what you need to uh, build muscle. You need a certain, you need 2.5 grams and you need enough of that dose to do it. Um, and it just needs to be on an empty stomach. Mm. And that's what you, and that's why you recommended yeah. the 30 to 40 grams of animal protein per meal, because that's, what's going to give you that leucine in, in food form. Correct. Correct. I want to activate mTOR. To me, I don't want to waste a, a hormonal metabolic opportunity. So if you're going to eat, the whole purpose should be, it's a way, again, I, I'm, I'm going to be 49 this month. So I have to optimize like every little kind of thing I do. So I can, when I'm having my fun, when I want to go off and eat the inside of some cheesecake or have my, my wine or whatever. Right. I'm not, I'm not paying the price too much. Cause I paid no price at 25. Right. But now it's <laughs> different. different. So yeah. So uh, you want to optimize hormonal signaling, right? Cause that's a big problem with how, uh, testosterone and growth hormone and everything is dropping as we age and, and, and are under way too much stress. I think everything's dropping artificially way sooner than it's supposed to. Because mm. if you look at primal tribes, they don't look like, and it's, it's their testosterone, estrogen, and things like that are different. There's two tribes in Russia. Everybody talks about these, uh, you know, blue zones and all oh, the oldest person, 120. No, that's not true. It's because we don't even know about all the tribes. The people in Russia keep their stuff on lockdown secret, but they have two groups up there, uh, the Yakutans and Altians. I always sometimes say their names wrong, Altuans or something, but the University of Tomsk in Siberia has studied them and published some stuff. We finally, you know, after the wall came down, something leak out, but they, they keep their information away from us. We don't know what the Russians know, but they have, those groups of people live to uh, 140 and their women are getting pregnant at 60. And this wow. is like standard. Yeah. So very, very different. So our aging process to me is, is, is very artificially accelerated by a lot of what we've been doing, you know, and, you know, by the way, they're pretty much carnivore. Um, but it, that their situation they think is coming down to the deuterium in the water. So their, their mitochondria are lasting a lot longer. So anyway, all that to say, yes, I don't, there's no snacking when anybody is my patient or I'm like, no, 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 no. That's whenever I see this whole carnivore snack crap all over Instagram, I'm like, why is anybody even using that word? And those things, it's, it's an oxymoron. There should be no such thing as a carnivore snack, right? Like there should be no keto snack. There's no snacking. That means you didn't eat enough. <laughs> so you eat more next time, right? Um, because yeah, you want that signal. I want to activate muscle building opportunity because when I, when I was younger, my testosterone was banging right? You, you can build, kids can build, uh, an 18 year old boy can build muscle on ho-hos and Twinkies because the testosterone is through the roof. Well, as, as it goes down, I have to leverage the meat. I have to leverage mTOR. Mm. So, yeah. So, so important. Tell us a little bit about your practice, brain and body solutions. How did that come to be? Oh, came to be, you, you know, you got to start, <laughs> you go to school to do it. I do. You got to start a business. <laughs> we don't get jobs. We start businesses. Um, but I did, I practiced, uh, I had a couple practices um, before I became a mother. So I was working and practicing and I focused a lot then on um, still the same conditions, a lot of autism, but I was, I was more kind of spiritual and esoteric and a lot of modality, a lot of Chinese medicine, a lot of meridian work and a lot of uh, pranic healing in the field stuff, right? So more body focused and off the body focused, uh, lots of ancestral uh, healing modalities, trained in a, a lot of that kind of stuff, a lot of nutritional uh, therapy. Then when I became a mother, when I got pregnant, um, it was a really tough pregnancy and unexpectedly I needed to be on bed rest about eight months, eight and a half months. So that, that wasn't my plan. Um, and I had two offices and I had to kind of put stuff in storage and, you know, just kept getting like, you're not getting out of this bed. I'm like, okay, well, I'll just, can people move things for me? Cause I don't know what, what's happening. Right. So it was an unexpected way to stop practicing temporarily, but, um, that's what I did. And I stayed home with my son, um, till he went to kindergarten. So, till he was five 
And then when I came back, you know, I was still obviously studying and still doing things and helping doctors. And, you know, it was kind of everybody's nutrition, every other doctor's lab nutrition kind of coach for free, just keeping my head in the game. When I came back, um, I was nervous to re to practice again. Right. I was like, well, I'm all out of money. So I guess I got to start up again and he's going to school and I, you know, I guess I got to do something, you know, cause I was having a good old time just being a mom. I'll tell you, I was having a really, really good time and just learning to be now learning alpha learning. My son taught me to slow the fuck down I and that. I loved every minute. I didn't <laughs> fight it. I didn't fight it. I didn't multitask. I didn't, you know, I didn't have a smartphone. I didn't, I didn't do any, I didn't watch TV. We just get in a stroller and let's go to park. And, you know, seven hours later, I don't know what we were doing, looking at tractors. I mean, you know, I mean, I had enough food and we were fine and I breastfed and I'm like, well, we're fine. Right. So it, I really, he slowed me down in ways. I, I, he was he's definitely my, my greatest teacher on that. So coming back, I will say I was nervous, right? I thought, oh, can I do this? I'm rusty. I don't know. What if I'm not good anymore? You know, all those voices in the head of like, which which are normal um, insecurities. And in that time, um, I was still always referring people to get neurofeedback or go do this and the things that helped my nephew. Yeah, Gapside, here's, you know, I still was working with all the, the Dan doctors, the Defeat Autism Now doctors. They were still teaching me stuff. I was still working with my nephew and everything. And in that time, my best friend uh, in Detroit, her son has cerebral palsy and a seizure disorder, and our, our boys are six months apart. So we were pregnant together. And Najee is, you know, in a wheelchair, has never spoken a word and ne never will. Um, and, but the seizures were really bad to the point, you know, there was lots of, lots of fears of would he make it to two or three years old? And, and he's now, you know, 16, but, you know, he's made it. Um, wow. Yeah. And th th thanks to the miracles of a lot of weed, I will say that. Hashtag <laughs> marijuana for the win. He, he's legally on a lot of marijuana. Wow. Um, it is what it is. So it, it does its job. Um, so I said to her, I, this article, I'm like, oh, you know, me, you got to get neurofeedback, you know? And she was, I just, I wish you could just do it. Why can't, and I was like, well, I don't do it. She's like, well, can't you just learn it? <laughs> I just looked at her like, <laughs> oh yeah, I can learn that. <laughs> just like that. You know, it was like an, it was a Christmas, Christmas at my brother's. I'll never forget. I went, why the hell didn't I think of that? <laughs> so then I said, let me learn this neurofeedback and let me get sort of, let me learn this different way. And my thinking was it was powerful and potent. It was one of the most advanced brain rehab things I've ever seen. It performed miracles with my nephew. And I just didn't think of myself doing it. And I liked the idea that I was putting a piece of technology between me and the patient. At that time, I wanted a barrier. Becoming a mother um, taught me how to do boundaries a little bit better. And I just thought I needed that to kind of not get as, because in the previous practice, again, very much trained empath. So I would be feeling everything people would come in with. And that's how I would know what was happening, right? So it's like, it's not, I don't need to see your labs. I know you have gallstones. I don't need to wow. see it. I know you have cancer. I can feel it. So it, it takes a toll on how you feel during the day. I knew how to shake it off. I knew how to clear it off, but it's, you know, I could be brought to tears in, in sessions all day long. It just was a normal way. And that's how I was good at what I could do. Well, I was scared to do that then. I was like, uh, I'm not doing that for anybody but him. So I don't know what to do right now. Like, I don't, what if I'm no good unless I can do that thing. Right. So that's kind of, that was my thinking behind it, to be honest. Um, but then eventually, sure enough, I, I was able to do all of it and blend it in a way that I, I, I learned how to protect myself, have better boundaries. He, he gave that gift to me. I'm like, Anna, nobody's important as him. So I got to go. And I'm saying no, and it, we're done. <laughs> but I didn't know how to do that before. Wow. <laughs> that's kind of happened. And so I, I went into that world. Uh, I just didn't think of myself as doing it. And it took my best friend to say, well, can't you just do it? And I went, oh, I guess I could I learn to do that. Wow. Yeah. And then from there, it's where like the, the magnetic therapies and the light therapies and the laser therapies, all of it are related when I realized that we're really electromagnetic beings of light. And that's what neurofeedback taught me. 
Um, and it's just, it's just potent. And I'm one of the few people that can blend the nutrition and gut and do functional testing because most neurofeedback practitioners are psychologists. That's the majority of the field was developed by psychologists. And that's the majority of who does it, which is a great thing, but they don't know anything about the other stuff. They don't know a serotonin from a dopamine from an endocannabinoid. They just, they aren't taught it really. Um, and so I bring that piece to it. So I'm kind of able to help uh, a group of people that really should be hospitalized, but I was able to kind of take them outpatient and uh, that really I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm like their last ditch. I'm like, well, I mean, one psychiatrist said to me once this patient, she had just come out of, it was probably her fourth or fifth hospitalization. She's 27 years old and all, all the hospitalizations are suicide attempts. Um, and she'd been on, I think it was somewhere in the, in the 25 to 30 different psych meds they, they've tried on her. She'd had electric shock wow. therapy. Wow. Like, right? This is like a devastating situation. You're like seeing that. And she was just the sweetest thing, you know, like sitting there before me crying, telling me these stories. And every time they go in, it's, it's trauma, it's more trauma. And, and psychologists really struggle with that 911 call. They, they know this is going to be worse. However, I can't let her hurt herself. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Oh, what do I do? You know, this is why they're begging for like MDMA um, and ketamine and things like that to be able to use instead. Cause oh, of you course. Use, get somebody that they're not going to want to kill themselves. And we don't have to, we don't have to strap them down. Just get them high real fast. And like, let's take a breather. I mean, right. it's, it's really the, the truth of it. It's like miracles for that situation. So anyway, I'm looking at the situation like, okay. I'm like, well, I don't know if I can help you. Let me talk to your psychiatrist, right? And so I kind of had to say to the psychiatrist, I'm like, look, tell me how stable are we? Is this active suicidal ideation? Where, how, what's the risk factor here, you know? And where, how stable are we with this? She was on about four or five meds at the time. And, I, and she'd only been out, she's been out of the hospital about seven days. And uh, the psychiatrist, famous words to me, here's the thing. We've done anything and everything that could possibly be done with this, you know, young woman over the last 10 years. Is there any way you could actually make it worse? I said, no. And she goes, then you need to do whatever it is you think you can do. Because short of you killing her, it can't get much worse. <laughs> I was like, wow. okay. Yeah. I was like, great. I'm like, you're going to work with me on managing this as the meds come off. She goes, yeah. Because that's the biggest risk factor is as we stabilize the brain, the meds have to be changed. And many psychiatrists are incredibly resistant to that. They're resistant to changing the meds, whether I'm fixing it, whether a DBT talk therapist is fixing it, it doesn't matter. They're just so locked in. Uh, no, they got to be on this dose for life. And we're like, nah, no, but I just changed the brain 35%. I have the brain maps to show it to you. Like, and they don't have the symptoms. So now we're getting side effects because these just like, it's just like titrating off insulin, right? Right. You drop the weight, you get back. Like, no, it's too much. Now we could kill them. We have to titrate as we're getting the system healthier. So that's their, your, the biggest thing is why I have to be working with, you know, somebody who's at least decent or at least can, <laughs> can at least try to understand what I'm doing. Um, yeah. So that's how it all kind of happened. And more and more, you know, psychologists and therapists that are doing brain therapies are learning, okay, I don't need to learn the functional stuff, but I, I can refer to you or refer to like that, you know, I, I know this matters. So I know what an organic acid test is cool. I, I'll just need to send us somebody to help get them done. And, and they'll, they're learning that now. Like I've had so many interns that are, um, cause to become board certified, you have to do so many sessions and intern with a person like me, a mentor, we sign off and all the kind of stuff that you go through for your board review. So I've had a lot of um, therapy students, psycholo psychologists, psychiatrists, um, and you know, people getting their like masters and, and social work or whatever, gonna be talk therapists of various sorts, learning it. And then they're coming in, they're figuring out how to do it. They get overwhelmed, it's too hard. I'm like, no, 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 you can, you can. And there's just, there's ways to take the, all the, the brain technologies. And I said, even if you just take this one thing and you implement this in your, what you're talking, you implement this with the meditation, then let me teach you that. You know, maybe you don't do it full blown the way I do, or maybe just now that you've interned here six months, you've decided you're not going to continue to do this with your practice, but then make sure you know to refer to me. One of my interns in medical school is going to be a, he's just graduated and he's like, um, he's, oh God, what is Barack being? I forget, but he was an intern with me at 17. He's a pediatric neurologist, I think. And part of his whole thing, he can't stand Western medicine. 
he can't stand it. He knew very clearly he didn't want to do it. His parents didn't vaccinate him at all. He had to go through the whole big decision. You know, Dr. Rimka, I'm going to medical school and they're going to make me take these things. Can you help mitigate it? Can What, what can I do to not like, you know, have neurological damage? He said, but it's so important to me to become the kind of physician that I want to be. And I'm going to do all the things that you do. I'm going to do all the things you taught me to help these kids and not let them know. And I'm like, oh man, you're the cutest thing ever. Right. So it, it, like they're more and more people are learning, like these things exist. And if you talk to any psychologist who's added neurotherapies into practice, they all say there is no, I cannot believe I ever tried to do this without it. Wow. I can't like what, what you can get done coupling your talk therapy alongside a brain therapy. It's insane. We can do one of my therapists who always refers to me, like every single one of her patients finally was coming to me and she's a DBT therapist here in Atlanta. And, and uh, DBT is like for, Trauma upon trauma upon trauma. I, I think it's probably the best trauma technique. DBT, you do first, you couple that with some EMDR, you couple that with neurofeedback, and, and we're going to bang it all out. Maybe some tray exercises in there. It, we're done and done. It's a, it, It'll never be with you again, it, period. Removed, gone, I'm wow. done. We'll talk about it. It's in your past, PTSD, my ass. You know what I mean? Like we're done, okay? So I don't, I'm not into people living with a diagnosis for forever at all. She told me, she's like 70, let me tell you. I said, what? She was what are, and she finally came in for all that. She came in for all the neural feedback for herself, for sleep. I said, you know, I can fix that for you. She's like, okay. So she tried and she's like, oh my God. I said, well, you know, I can do all this other stuff for your patients. Right. So she started sending them. She's like, well, people already, I know of you because my patients were coming to you. And I was like, who is this woman? And what is she doing? Right. <laughs> so then she started sending me everybody. And she was 70 in three months. I get more done in the three months they see you and come to me simultaneously, like then in the first two years of them seeing me, like it's unbelievable. That's I can't, amazing. it's crazy. And I was like, really? Now she knows that she didn't stop what she's doing and go learn it. She's, in, in, she's like 60. She's been practicing along. She doesn't want to stop and learn now. She's like, well, I had to send them to you. I'll do what I do. And, and, and I know what you're doing and I know how quickly we can get this done now. Right. So the more therapists can figure it out and whether or not they want to learn it. Great. I, I love it. Or find somebody that you can work with locally and do the two together. Cause it's, that's unbelievable. And especially like throwing in, in body work, um, things like trauma release exercises, the shaking method or hands-on fascial, myofascial release. All of that has a big, big play in, in moving stress and trauma out of the system. Wow. That is absolutely incredible. I was going to ask if you had a few success stories to share and those that you shared are absolutely incredible. What does it mean to you to not just work with people one-on-one, -on -one, but also work with other, you know, experts in their fields and be helping their people along as well? Like you, the, the scope of the number of people that you can help is just so much bigger. What does that mean to you? Um, well, <laughs> in the one hand, I'm going to say, I don't really think about it, but it's all I think about at the same time. So fortunate or unfortunately, kind of one of my little, you know, little scripts that I learned um, and the thing I struggle with personally, so it's my own Stephanie thing, is making sure my life is of value, right? To me, I have to justify every day why, you know, like I'm not, I'm not a parasite. I'm not just taking oxygen. Um, and that's just my own my own trauma story, right? My own trauma birth, my own whatever soul transcendent experience. So I have to constantly look for justification that I've done enough and that I'm helping enough. And I, I, my purpose clearly here is service. That's not everybody's purpose, but that is mine. Um, so the more I can, let me tell you, when I got to a place in practice, where I never did any marketing, never did anything. And I got to that point that it was just, we were six weeks booked, always full, everything, you know, six week new patient. Like we can't even get somebody in. She goes, we can't even get anybody in. I was like, oh, okay. And that was 100% referral from talk therapists and psychiatrists and physicians in Atlanta, referring to the wackadoodle chiropractor who doesn't even wear shoes in her office. Like I literally <laughs> practice barefoot and I wear models. We love, it. Like, we love You it. know, they're just like, and the patients would come in and they're like, I don't really know, but he just said to do whatever you said to do. He said, just trust her. Like she's 
not going to wear shoes, but like she knows what she's doing. And I'm like, okay. And these are coming from, you know, ER physicians, functional medicine physicians that that's the kind of relation they're bringing their own kids. Like, oh, she has ADHD. We're not doing the drugs. So fix it. Okay. You know what I mean? Like that, when I got to that point, I was like, oh man, this is great. Because then we were in a community together. Then I knew I had good physicians to send my people to. We're all sharing each other and we can just get on the phone and just say, all right, can I talk to you real quick about this one? He's, I don't know what I like, what I'm seeing. I really need you to order MRI. I think we got Alzheimer's. Oh man. You know, like just that type of way you're knowing people are getting really good care, right? Because people will see me two, three times a week uh, for the brain therapies and they won't see that physician, but once every few months. And I'm the one to say, we have a major decline. I think it's Alzheimer's. I need you to I need you to tell, I need, I need some stuff. And he's like, oh, okay, send her back in, right? So I think it's just knowing that people are getting, they're in the best hands possible, right? Because I know they're physicians. I know they're therapists. I know these people are dedicated. I know what, you know, we're all in it to win it. So it's the exact opposite of what I was seeing when I was in my 20s, where it didn't seem like anybody cared. It didn't seem like people were just being thrown away. They're just being given some drugs and then more drugs on top of drugs. And I didn't want to be a part of that. And that's not what I'm a part of. So in general, I mean, it means that like, I'm like, yeah, I guess I, I make an impact, but I'm kind of one of those people, a very dopaminergic person where I don't think I'm ever doing enough. So I'm always looking for more and that's what I'm always trying to do. So I'd like to reach more and more. Um, and that's why the group courses and, and things like that came about to kind of like, well, I, I can only see so many people uh, at a time and in a day and you know that I can handle so if I start doing some group courses, maybe I can help people with the foundation and less people will need to see, maybe they, either when they see me, they're, they're more ready and it'll take less time or they won't need to see me at all. You know, like I would love nothing more than to put myself out of business. I don't know what the hell else I would do, but uh, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy if, if nobody was suicidal again, if nobody had bipolar, if nobody was having panic attacks, if nobody was psychotic, that would make my day. If nobody had autism, ADHD, you know, seizures, great. I'll go find, I'll go, you know, I don't know, buy alpaca farm or something. I would find something to do, but, uh, and don't joke, because I kind of considered doing that before in my twenties as well. Um, yeah, it's like, so, so, you know, it makes me feel good, I guess. I just feel like there should be more of us doing it. I still am at a point in my life and my career where I'm frustrated at the lack of, of, stuff that I see people doing and then how many people are hurting we've had a really big increase in depression and suicidal thinking and addiction in the last two years because of what's going on and um, everybody I know is full and overwhelmed all the clinicians are like oh I can't see anymore I, I'm, I'm I'm burnt out you know I'm burnt out or I can't take anymore or the people who need our help you know they're struggling financially they can't afford us um, but we can only afford to drop our rates so much or do what we can't because then we're not okay, right? It, it's so, I feel good, but I'm also really, really frustrated. And I wish I had a better answer to helping more people in a way that, you know, I don't think anything should be free because people don't value that. But um, in a way that was more cooperative community where we all could be taking care of each other and in a way that, way that was fair, Um and, and so that, that is lacking and uh, it does frustrate me, right? Yeah. When I, somebody come in and I realize they can't afford me. They can't, they can't afford to do what I'm going to tell them to do. Or I give them a referral and they can't, they're like, well, I can't afford it. I'm like, oh, so I'm really, it's, it's taking me down a rabbit hole of um, getting more into kind of old ancient home remedies at this point, because I'm like, well, how cheap can I get this done? <laughs> you know, like, what can I give them that will empower them that they'll have on hand that they can use for a number of situations? So I'm kind of going there right now in my career, really kind of looking backwards to say, what did we used to know that we've thrown away? How, how old school can I take this? I haven't found huge uh, mental health things yet, but, I, but a few. I probably have found a few. I found a few bizarre treatments for schizophrenia that I thought, really? Like, if this, if wow. this is legit, this is a game changer, right? Wow. But I'm still exploring. I'm not willing to talk about some of those publicly yet. But yeah, so that's where I'm at in my career. Never enough, right? It is never, I don't, I don't know any doctor that's helping people with that 
ever feels as enough, right? I call it, I call it the E word. And seriously, I can never grasp what that word means. When is it the time of the day that I close my laptop and say my work is done for the day? And if I did any good, great. And if not, I got to try again tomorrow, but enough is a really tough thing to come to terms with for sure. Yeah. Only for the dopamine people, right? It, it's only for us. Dopamine is more, right? We're always chasing more. Yeah. Um, and, and which is beautiful. Um, it's, but it's a double-edged sword molecule. It makes us explore. It makes us create. It makes us think like nobody else. Humans have more dopamine than any animal, animal on earth. So we can think better than any animal on earth. However, it makes us constantly dissatisfied. So some people have way more uh, dopamine going on and they're your creative geniuses. They're your Tesla. They're your Einstein, but they're also plagued with suffering and loneliness and isolation and even psychosis. So too much dopamine is also schizophrenia, psychosis, right? So it's that that fine line of genius or you know, there's psychotic behavior, delusion, um, and versus you know the group of the serotonin, the endocannabinoid, oxytocin, vasopressin. Those are those are just alpha present now. We're satisfied with where everything's enough. When you have those, you're like, what? Why would I? You know, like hopefully you have enough with your wife. If you don't, you end up cheating, right? So there's a ba- there's a there's a balance between those two different systems in the in the brain. And my job is to be looking at, okay, where are we imbalanced, and where where is the optimal for this person? Because I'm I'm not supposed to make them equal. Like if you're if you're a much more serotonin based person, I'm going to keep you that way. But I got to make sure we still have dopamine that you can feel and create and think well, and still have the pleasure hit from doing something because if it's too tanked, it's no good. If it's too high. It's no good. <laughs> right. Those two, they're like, a, they're like a seesaw. They go up and down with each other. Um, so, you know, so we're, we're a certain type and I think podcasters are a certain type and trainer, anybody who's a doctor, a fit personal trainer, a podcast, we're all dopamine people. <laughs> we're all, <laughs> we're all the same, you know, we're not the people who are like, Oh, see, you just, just enjoy the moment. We're like, I enjoyed it for 32 seconds. Aren't we done with it? <laughs> that's, that's a dopamine person, right? So I don't, I don't shame, I don't shame us for being driven, uh, but I do need to slow us down. So we don't get burnt out. We don't have mental health breakdowns. We don't burn ourselves into MS or, or things like that, that we can keep methylating properly, you know? Um, so we do, we do have downsides to our, to our behavior, but to some people there is, they do know what enough is. They really do. They're very settled people. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're very happy. Yeah. yeah they're way happier. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh... Damn. This has been such an amazing conversation. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. Where do you want people to go to connect with you and your work and the group programs and everything that you have to offer at Brain and Body Solutions? Um, right there, brainandbodysolutions.com. Uh, that's the best way you can get right to uh, my online store where I have a bunch of uh, tech devices, biohacking devices, ranging from things that, you know, brain modulation devices to saunas to a bunch of meat if you want you know grass-fed meats and all the big deal from local farmers i got all that stuff too Uh, peptide therapy you can make an appointment if you want to become a patient um, and you can see about my retreats and you can see about my courses so i do have a retreat coming up and we do have a few spots because it was covid and crazy and it got canceled and moved and shut down but uh, in april we're going uh, to south africa on a 10-day safari Um, And it is a keto carnivore um, type thing. I've opened up to say, well, they can have a few plants, I guess, if they're local. (laughs) Um, That's coming up in April. We got a few spots, but my group courses uh, are there as well. So that'll get you everything. All my social media, brainandbodysolutions.com. Awesome. That's great. We will link to that in the show notes. Dr. Rimka, again, such an amazing conversation. What a cool story that you have and, and what an amazing gift to be able to branch out and use so many different tools to help people out and get that message out where again, it can help so many people. We're just so grateful for you and your work and the time that you took to be on our show today. So thank you so very much. We really, really appreciate you. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.